To forget or not to forget, you're watching my review of Finding Dory. Name's Hank. I have to find my family. That's a hard one, kid. Well, I guess you're stuck here. You're not helping, Bill. Dory, you are about to find your parents. And when you do that, you'll be home. I am a huge fan of both Disney and Pixar. I'm a bit more of a fan of Disney, but I think Pixar is absolutely amazing. It's pretty much Disney than Pixar, right? But that one, like very, very, very minute. So I have been anxiously awaiting Finding Dory ever since Finding Nemo pretty much came out. And what still baffles me is how Toy Story got two other sequels and is getting a third sequel. And Cars and Monsters University also got sequels and Dory had to wait 10 years plus. Or Nemo had to wait 10 years plus to get Dory. So this is a spoiler and non-spoiler review. And before I get into the super heavy spoilers, I'm going to just do you know my non-spoiler review. Then I'll let you guys know. And if you want to turn back... Um, you know, feel free to, and then come back to discuss Finding Dory when um, you've seen it. So uh, let's talk about logistics really, 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 really fast. So the first Finding Nemo movie was made for $94 million, and it made $936 million, but that's also including the re-release in 2012, I believe. Now, Dory is made for $200 million. Now, it's definitely going to make back that budget, but you can truly see that they put that budget to good use. Also, I think with having El DeGeneres and Idris Alba in this film, they needed to shovel out a little bit uh, more for their salaries. So, Finding Dory is you know worth two hundred million dollars in the eyes of Pixar and Disney. It's fifty million dollars less than the budget of the Avengers: Age of Ultron, which is actually kind of wild. But it's sixty million dollars left than the less than the budget of Tangled. So will Dory make a billion dollars? Most likely because it just has the four corners that people, that affects everyone. It has children, it has adults, it has young adults, and the last corner I'm just going to kind of use as miscellaneous, but I feel like everyone would want to see this because it's a Pixar film, and like it or not, everyone has a tie to Pixar. So let's talk some non-spoilers really, uh, really quick first. The animation of this movie is breathtaking. It's absolutely spectacular. I was in love with it. The detail of Marlin and Dory and uh, everyone's uh, scales and skin just is so stunning. It's it's so lifelike and realistic and water is one of the most difficult things to animate and Pixar just has some type of formula that's able to completely make it look like it's fluid and real fluid for water and I absolutely love the way it was done. So the the animation is one of the best I've ever seen. The voice acting is also terrific. Now, um, Hayden Rollins is the voice of Nemo in this film, and he was voiced by Alexander Good. I have my, just a couple notes right here in the first one. And uh, so the original voice actor of Nemo obviously could not come back, but that was also because he grew up. And he just doesn't sound like Nemo anymore. But all of the voice acting was so, so fantastic. I believe, actually I know, my favorite character is Ed O'Neill's Hank, who was the Septipus. Um, there's a scene, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then I also loved Ty Burrell's Bailey, who plays the Beluga, Rail, uh, Beluga Whale. It was, those two characters were the breakout characters for the new characters from this film. And they were just so, so funny. So animation was fantastic. Voice acting was great. Writing and direction was was beautiful. I have to say, I don't think I've been so impressed with a Pixar, with a Pixar film um, since pretty much Inside Out. And now that's kind of a weird thing to say, but I love dinosaurs. And when The Good Dinosaur came out, I was expecting so much from it. And I was so disappointed. And this movie, in my opinion, is on the level of Inside Out. Inside Out was so beautiful. And this movie is just, it's fantastic. Andrew Stannon is the director of this film and also the, a, a major contributor to the screenplay. Also, it was written by Victoria Strauss as well. And they have a very special screenplay here. Now, what's interesting to me about Finding Dory is it's not just about finding, you know, her family. It's about finding herself as well. Now, Dory, you know, she's an ascetic. You know, she has horrible, horrible memory loss and she is essentially living with a disability. And I really like how Pixar is able to touch on how to live with disabilities in this world. It's very, very beautiful. It's very much done in the Pixar fashion. And also, um, just another fun thing that Pixar does very, very well is their shorts. The animated short Piper that plays before this is adorable. It's about seagulls and a little uh, um, hermit crab. So I really, really like that. And I hope you guys will all enjoy the short Piper that plays before it. 
So the animation is great. Andrew Stanton's directing is, is fantastic. Uh, the only little problem that I have with it is like it just dives into the plot, which is like a weird thing to say. Now, Pixar has a very congruent formula, which works for them. I love it. I'm a very big fan of the Pixar formula because I always feel that even though it's it's formulaic, what they insert is always exciting and interesting to watch because it's always new in some ways. Uh, they just very much jump into the finding of Dory's family and going on the mission. There's no build up to it. That's the only little critique of, of the film I have. Um, other than that, I would say it's a downright good film that you should all check out because, like I said, it's breathtakingly animated beautifully. That's a weird thing to say. It's breathtakingly animated. It's so beautiful. The voice acting is so great. Even Ellen DeGeneres, who I feel doesn't want to actually act, I feel like she really did act and put a lot of good time into Dory. She's been promoting Finding Dory on her show for quite a while, and I it was well worth the promotion because she's she is Dory. And what's beautiful about uh, when I was watching Dory is I'm not seeing Ellen DeGeneres. I'm seeing Dory. So uh, animation is, uh, is elegant. The characters are fun. The plot is great. Andrew Stanton did a great job with the screenplay and the directing. And I really hope you guys will all go check out Finding Dory. So now let's talk spoilers for the film. And I'm going to do it by... By characters because it's the best way in my opinion to dissect it. So I'm just going to start off and uh, if you're seeing me, my eyes looking away from the camera it's because I'm just looking at the voice actors names and who they play because I just don't want to forget any names. So I'll start off with uh, Idris Alba's Fluke. Now he is a, uh, a black sea lion and or actually he's just he's a sea lion and I have to say I loved him. He was so, 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 so funny in this film. And Idris Alba has done a lot of work for Disney. He was in Zootopia. He was in The Jungle Book. So I love the fact that they're giving him more work. But I'm curious to see him in more live-action films. But Fluke is a great character. And the way he interacts with both Marlon and Nemo is so funny. And also, at the same time, the way he's interacting with Dory is uh, extremely funny as well. Then you have uh, Diane Keaton and Eugene Levy as Jenny and Charlie, who are Dory's parents. And first off, their animation is stellar. Like, they're very, you can clearly tell that they're related to Dory, but at the same, obviously because they're blue tangs, but they're very unique in their animation style. We see other blue tangs in this film that are not unique, and their animation of Charlie and Jenny is, like, blew me away. Their voice acting is so, so good. And uh, Diane Keaton and Eugene Levy are both comedians, and... They just have a very soft tone here, and I really like it, because sometimes their comedy can be a little eh. And uh, I really love the way that they deliver their lines. And so to kind of just go off into like a bit more spoilers, which you're probably waiting for, what happens in the beginning of the film is Dory has always been anesthetic, and she gets separated from her parents. And obviously it's Finding Dory. And then we get a little bit of a flash into what happened in Finding Nemo, or how Marlon and Dory met. And then we, you know, we go to the reef. And then at the reef, we see Mr. Ray. And Mr. Ray, you know, talks about the Great Reef Migration, which is also in the trailer for the film. And then following that, we go right into uh, Dory, essentially, wanting to find her family. And so we get to meet Crush again, and we get to see Squirt, which was really great. And they take them to California, which is where Dory's family was. So Dory essentially grew up in the California uh, Ocean Institute. And then she gets sucked out by accident because there's a very strong current that you know leads to a drain. And Dory, because she's so small as a child, uh, can't really swim too well. And she's able to fit through the bars of the drains and goes right out. And then her parents lose her. And her parents, what they want to do is find her, obviously. And so what they do is they go into quarantine thinking Dory got pulled there, but Dory got pulled out into the ocean, and they wait in quarantine for a long time, realizing she's gone, then go in the ocean. And there's very many flashbacks in this film to establish Dory's character to make her more developed. And what you find out is Dory loves seashells and that her parents love seashells. And because her parents were waiting for her to come home, they figured it would make sense to travel the ocean that Dory should come back home, because everyone eventually comes back home. They lay out these beautiful seashells in all different directions for Dory to fall out. Now, as, in terms of how far the shells go out, it's a little um, unspecified, but it's far enough that you can see it. And uh, Dory sees a, sh a shell line, and she follows it up and sees her parents, and all the flashbacks in the film kind of come together in a very congruent and nice way. So I really, really like that. 
Now, in addition to Dory's parents, we have Ed O'Neill Hank. And Hank has some of the best lines in this film. Ed O'Neill did a fantastic job with his delivery. Now, for all of you who are not fans of Modern Family, Ed O'Neill plays uh, Jay on Modern Family. He plays Sofia Vergara's husband. He's a very funny comedian. And what happens is after Dory and Marlon get to the Oceanographic Institute, and Nemo's with them as well. And by the way, the way they get to the Institute is, like I said, they go with surfing. They go surfing with Crush and Squirt. And following that, they end up in like this sunken area where, or this area where all these ships are sunk and they, they run into a giant squid and the giant squid tries to eat them. Nemo gets hurt and then Marlin kind of gets mad at Dory for uh, Nemo's pain. And following that, Nemo and Marlin kind of just swim away from Dory for just a few minutes for Nemo to essentially recover because Marlin no intention of abandoning Dory and Dory goes up to the surface. She gets caught in a bag and then she stays in the quarantine area of SeaWorld. So she was actually with her she was very close to her parents the whole time without knowing that, but we also don't know that either until like, the last half an hour of the film. And then Ed O'Neill's character comes in, and there's a scene in the trailer where you remember he touches the, the outlet, and you hear the buzzing sound of the trash masher, or garbage disposal, and essentially he loses a tentacle, and that's why he becomes a septopus, not an octopus. And they're a duo. They're they're in, they're very much a, a dynamic duo. They travel through all these exhibits trying to find uh, Dory's family. And Dory has a little tag on her fin. And Ed O'Neill's character Hank wants to forever be behind glass in an exhibit. He hates being touched. And so Dory has a tag, and you need that tag to be in those exhibits. And he says to Dory, "If I help you find your family, you'll give me the tag." And she goes, "Okay," but she keeps forgetting through most of the film, which is just par for the course of Dory. And eventually what happens is they end up meeting uh, Caitlin Olsen's Destiny, a essentially blind whale shark who is so funny and beautifully animated. I love Destiny. And they meet Ed O'Neill's, uh, not Ed O'Neill, they meet Ty Burrell's Bailey. Now Bailey is so, so funny because he's a beluga whale and he believes that his, um, not hypnosis, his uh, echolocation is broken. And Destiny says it's not broken, it's not broken, and eventually he fixes it, and his echolocation becomes a very big part of the story with helping Dory find her family and helping Dory find Marlon and Nemo. So what's happening also after Marlon and Nemo, or after Dory was taken from Marlon and Nemo, um, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting? What happens after Dory gets taken from Marlon and Nemo, they meet Idris Alba's Fluke, and Fluke then gets Rebecca, pretty much a crazy bird, to get them into the Marine Life Institute, and they have their own couple of adventures in there as well, but eventually they all meet up with Dory. So uh, Bailey and Kate and uh, Bailey and Destiny are essentially a duo as well. So the film is very much uh, very duo centric with um, Char Jenny and Charlie, Bailey and Destiny, Nemo and Marlin, Dory and um, Hank. And I really actually like that setup. It's different from Pixar setups because normally it's either like a trio and then part of the trio gets separated, but here it's all duos most of the time. So uh, Marlon and Nemo are trying to find Dory, but Dory is trying to find her family, and then eventually they end up in this huge, like, a cylindric um, aquarium exhibit, and that's where Dory came from. And then uh, another little hermit crab actually tells her what happened to her family, and then they realize she's in quarantine, so they have to end up going back to quarantine. And there's a great scene where Dory goes essentially through the pipes that made her lose her family, and... She's lost, and she's screaming for help. And we learn that she became friends with Destiny the Whale because they were pipe buddies, so somehow Dory was able to get close to the pipes and speak, and Destiny could hear that, and they would go, Hello! And following that, uh, Dory's able to communicate with Destiny, and then Bailey's able to use his echolocation, and the two of them are able to uh, lead Dory out of the pipes and back into quarantine where she's able to then end up with Marlon and Nemo and then end up meeting a bunch of blue tanks where they tell her that her parents are dead even though they're not her parents are actually outside waiting for her. So there's a whole bunch of chaos with a truck where Marlon, Marlon and Nemo go into a truck and then uh, Hank's in the truck and then Dory gets into the water. And Dory meets her family and this new scene is beautifully is beautifully done. Just the, re the reunion scene is fantastic. And following that, uh, Ed O'Neill's Hank essentially hijacks a truck 
and then the truck crashes into the water and then there's a great uh louis armstrong song that plays when the truck crashes there's so much illegal antics that play in this film and it it i guess sort of makes it a little less real but at the same time the movie's about talking fish so why am i worried about realism here it just doesn't really make sense so uh they all get reunited and then they essentially go back to the drop-off in Australia where they live, which I thought was really a great way to end it because Mar Marlin and Dory, Nemo, Charlie and Jenny all become a family. Like they're like this weird mixed family and it's beautiful. Like you wouldn't think that all these species would want to live essentially next to each other or with each other, but they do. And it's awesome. It's really great. And then Dory says, I'm going to go to the drop-off and look at the view because it was the whole thing with the beginning of the film where Marlon says we can never go to the drop-off without something bad happening. And Dory just goes to the drop-off and she looks at it and she goes, it's a nice view. And Marlon says, yes, it is. And it, then the film goes to black. Actually, the credits are really interesting. It goes to black. It goes to the credits. And following the credits, we see the tanking again which was also a nice little cameo. Their cameo was so short, I thought they would actually be in the, in the Marine Life Institute, but they ended up being uh, just in the very end of the film, in the bag. But they were in the bag for a year. The credits say the movie takes place one year after the events of Nemo, not six months, like the, it says online. And it, it was weird to me that they were in a bag for so long, because how did they not die? But I shouldn't dissect it like that. So I love the ending of the film. I thought it was beautiful. I think it ends the franchise. Now, should this have taken over 12 years to make? Absolutely not, because it's just ridiculous that it took so long to get up. But at the same time, I would say it, it was totally worth the wait because I was absolutely in love with it. Uh, Nemo didn't do as much as I thought he would. Just another another character uh, discussion real quick. Uh, I mean, Hayden Rollins was quite good in his role. Uh, his The role of Nemo was essentially to help Marlin uh, get over hard times when he was trying to find Dory because Marlin's the secondary character here while in the first movie he was the main character essentially Nemo and Marlin and Dory switched roles so overall I would say this is a fantastic film I hope it joins the Billion Dollar Club I loved it so much and I hope that you guys all enjoyed it as well or uh, have enjoyed it if you've seen it and thank you so much for tuning into my spoiler review to the movie. And we'll talk real soon about uh, Finding Dory in the comments below. And I'll cover more movies this summer, including Suicide Squad, The Legend of Tarzan, possibly The Purge. I'm not sure if I want to do that one. But I'm definitely going to be covering a couple more summer movies. But I am so looking forward to Moana. And I'm going to be doing a Pixar video, uh, hopefully tomorrow, and discussing Pixar's future with Incredibles 2, Toy Story 4, Cars 3, and um, Kubo. The, 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 the original movie that I'm not 100% sure of the title. Anyway, I really thought the film was special. Uh, the beluga whale and um, the whale shark were great characters. Like, they are so, so funny. They really stuck out to me, Destiny and Bailey. Also, Ty Burrell played Phil on Modern Family, so they have a couple Modern Family characters in here, and I really like that. It had great comedy, great chemistry with all the actors, even though they technically weren't in the same booths filming at the same time. So anyway, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk real soon about Finding Dory in the comments. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you like what you see, and make sure to check out the Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat page, and that would be awesome. All right, guys. Bye.